I, I am the um, poultry specialist for Utah State University, and uh, I received my training with, uh, with Oregon State University and also uh, with the University of California, Davis, doing a residency there in poultry. And um, I'm also board certified as in the American College of Poultry Veterinarians as a poultry diagnostician and veterinarian. Appreciate everyone coming to the conference today. And um, we're going to talk about a subject that uh, if you haven't heard of, you haven't been to the store in the last six months, and that's avian influenza, high path. And uh, that's a real problem uh, within the world today. And it's just not here in the United States. This is the first time that we've had a high path AI of this nature um, in the United States. It actually comes from a goose in Guangdong, uh, China. And it's been a problem in the, the East, in the Far East for a number of years. And it's finally jumped across the, the, the sea and now we have been dealing with it. And I just want to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, first of all, an overview of it, and then just an update of what's happening in Utah, and then what you as um, producers can, can do to keep your chickens from having problems. I'm going to skip that page. Now, uh, on TV, we've seen a lot of coronavirus type things. And, um, and a influenza virus is, is very similar. Um, in that it has these uh, proteins sticking out the, the, the top of it. And there's two kinds. There's a hemagglutinin, um, which is represented by those posts, and then a neuraminidase, which is represented like that. Um, there's 15 types of hemagglutinins and nine types of neuraminidase, and they can combine in any combination as the, as the virus resorts. Um, and so you can have an H1 and 6. You can have an H... Um, five and two, that type of thing. So the, the one that we're dealing with right now is um, an H, um, an H5N1, which is um, a highly pathogenic type of influenza virus. Um, this is just a photomicrograph here of uh, those spiky things showing up uh, along the surface. And these are the elements that allow the, the virus to enter cells and to exit cells. And depending on how they uh, go together, um, they are able to cause damage in uh, only the respiratory tract and the, and the GI tract, or in the case of high path, they're able to get into uh, capillaries and other things. And so the flu that we get is, uh, you know, it's either a runny nose, sneezing, that type of thing, or intestinal uh, that's because uh, these viruses can only um, replicate in places where there's a particular enzyme. There's actually three types of influenza viruses. There's, there's type A, B, and C. Um, human beings can get all three types of these viruses. However, uh, waterfowl um, can only be infected with influenza type A. Waterfowl are actually the natural hosts for all avian influenza viruses, and, and usually it doesn't cause any kind of a problem in a waterfowl whatsoever. And um, as these H's and N's resort, they resort into subtypes and strains. For instance, um, uh, if these combined in an H5N2, that would be the subtype, but all N5, H5N2s don't act the same. And so there's strains that are more, um, uh, could be more pathogenic in there than, than others. Uh, we did actually have H5N1s in the um, United States before, but uh, not this particular strain that's causing such uh, difficulty. Of all these, uh, what, 144, whatever those permutations and combinations could be, only H5s and H7 subtypes have the potential to go from what we call a low pathogenic. In other words, they just don't cause a lot of problems in in birds, there might be a little bit of sniffing, uh, that type of thing, uh, to a high pathogenic um, strain, which can cause very heavy mortality. And the reason for that is these two subtypes have the ability to um, mutate very rapidly. Influenza viruses can mutate very rapidly because they are an RNA virus and um, and uh, it, they have a lot of mistakes when they're replicating themselves. And so that's the reason why they can survive is because they make these, these replication errors and then they can live in different environments. 
And so then um, if it does go high path, um, the virus itself can get into other cells besides just the intestinal tract and the, um, um, the respiratory tract. Now, I've got to make it clear that, that low path and high path refer only to birds. This has nothing to do with human beings and, and so forth. One common question is, is that is this high path AI that's going around um, in the United States and Canada right now, uh, can human beings uh, get it as a problem? Um, there's only been one case of uh, isolation in, in a person in the, in the United States. And um, so the chances of you getting this from your birds is very, very slim, uh, next to none. Um, and uh, in other parts of the world where they've had prolonged contact, there have been some human cases, but there's no, there's been no uh, cases of transmission from one human being to another. So you don't have to worry from a personal standpoint um, about this, this thing. Um, let's talk, look at the, the flyways for a minute. And um, yeah, people have made these maps on this is where birds go and all this kind of stuff as if they were I-15 and, and I-80 corridors. Um, birds don't always follow the, the, the pictures and they go where they want. One time I was sitting out in front of my, of my um, office here at West Campus at Snow College and saw a warbler that is only found on the eastern seaboard. And so they do get uh, uh, blown off course. They can get in other places and things like that. But basically, the flyways act like this. Um, first isolation in North America happened in Nova Scotia up here. It happened in, in a spring migration uh, last year, which was, was kind of threw everybody off because we were all looking for that fall migration when things are starting to come back down after um, commingling in, in the Arctic. And so it started up there during the spring migration and um, worked its way down the eastern seaboard and then eventually into um, central uh, United States and then all over the place. I'm going to show you a cool um, video here in just a second. This is a live bird migration map. And uh, just to show you what could be happening um, this May, um, as far as the migration patterns go, let's just go, go back to last year's May. And let's just pick a date of um, May 15th, for instance. And what this will do is it'll populate and then um, there's radars all over the United States and it will uh, show where the, the uh, migration traffic is and thousands of birds per kilometer per hour. And uh, the lighter it gets, the, the more birds there are. And so I'll just set this in motion. And also the red line indicates sunset and the white line or the yellow line will indicate uh, dawn. And so if we just put that in motion, um, we can see it's now becoming dark. And uh, look at that. We see that the migration occurs during the night, don't we? Uh, but look at the, the areas in Utah too, they're migrating right through there. And, and so we could uh, run into some um, heavy migration patterns again this year. And um, I've looked at this over a number of months and, and even years, and uh, you can see that uh, that's that's what happens. And uh, and so then they'll sit tight for the day on ponds and so forth, and then at night they'll they'll uh, start off again. And so this is just repeating what we saw. And there's the sunset, and away they go. And 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 look at the amount along the Wasatch Front, particularly uh, a lot of them. So uh, we can't. We're we're going to have exposure to these viruses. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, if we look at the detections in Utah since April, our first index case occurred in April of 2022. And this is unique because it occurred in a backyard flock of 10 birds, uh, 10 chickens. And uh, it was in a suburban area of Utah County. Now, how in the world would that happen? Well, first of all, this uh, really threw us for a loop for two reasons. First of all, um, Avian influenza has never been detected in backyard flocks in the history of Utah. And uh, second of all, uh, particularly high path just showing up like that. Um, well, what eventually happened was that um, uh, these birds were allowed access to Provo River. And obviously there were some uh, birds upstream that were shedding the virus into the water. 
We also had a really bad outbreak in April in Cash Valley of a commercial layer industry that cost uh, millions of dollars. Um, it was just a, a, a bad thing. So the non-commercial ones, which would be the backyard flocks or the red ones, you can see we had a couple in May, uh, one in June. We've had one every month except September. Um, these spikes are commercial turkey operations in San Pete County. However, after, oh, we also did have, the, the November outbreak was actually a um, game bird facility in Southern Utah too. So we've never had uh, influenza like this in game birds. And now it's happening um, in Kansas and Nebraska, um, all over the place. And so this virus is acting differently than anything we've ever had before. The, um, it's considered a foreign animal disease. The government is trying to stamp it out, and that's how they uh, operate, is by a stamping out procedure, and um, it's not working. Um, we're just continuing to get outbreaks um, all across the country in, in Canada, Mexico. Now South America is exploding, but in Utah here in, in December, January, and February, we didn't have any outbreaks. Now the, the DWR and uh, the federal folks have been monitoring the um, uh, this virus in in the wild birds, and uh, they've been getting reports of birds dying. Uh, they a lot of them coming to our lab at Spanish Fork, and um, this is as of middle of February. This is a breakdown of the wild birds that have uh, died or else been cultured um, and detected with the with the high path AI, and um, you can see that the waterfowl, the ducks and the geese, and if we put in the shorebirds, that's almost two thirds or th three quarters of all the isolations and detections have occurred in waterfowl, which is crazy because they're resistant to it. They don't die, they just uh, carry it around. That's their, their natural host. The, the goose particularly um, is a, a very resistant um, waterfowl, the mallard duck is, and we're seeing this thing kill even the natural host. And so it's a really lethal type situation. If we look at all the uh, high path AI uh, isolations that have occurred, uh, you can see that the breakdown, commercial poultry red, uh, the backyard flocks are, are the yellow, wild birds green and so forth. You can see that most of that has occurred along the Wasatch Front in Utah. There's been some outliers that they've been able to isolate. So this thing is not gonna go, go away folks. And, um, and so we need to hunker down and, and uh, protect our birds um, with it. Um, hopefully the federal government um, will be able to work with their, their partners in import export and be able to uh, do some things that can help us maybe control this because this is not a pandemic anymore. This is an endemic situation that uh, we're gonna be dealing with in the United States. This is not a foreign animal disease of a couple of outbreaks you stamp out. It's um, it's continuing to increase and our, our efforts and protocol have just not worked yet. And so things have got to change somehow. So what can you do um, and look for in your flock um, if you might have a problem? The first thing that I would consider is, do you have any unexplained death? Or any precipitous mortality. Now, this this is not um, four or five birds in a corner. A rat got in there and they they uh, they scared themselves and got in a corner and suffocated. That's an explained death. That's it might be a precipitous mortality, but it's an explained death. If you have two birds in the backyard and one dies, that's fifty percent mortality. But really, that's not um, anything that would be called a precipitous mortality. Um, I'm talking about like if you have 200 chickens and uh, three die one day, um, 100 die the next day, and the next day you might have one or two living. That is precipitous mortality, and that's exactly how this thing operates uh, in a flock. And so you'll know you have problems if you get it. Uh, other things that you may see are swelling of the head, eyelids, comb, waddles, and shanks, along with purple discoloration of those same um, tissues. The purple discoloration is the in influenza virus actually breaking the capillaries and causing blood to come out. So you have this hemorrhage and this bruising looking stuff. Um, also stumbling or falling down, tremors or circling, any kind of, and I'm talking about the birds, not the owners uh, on this. Uh, they, uh, there's neurologic problems that uh, might occur. And um, then also runny nose or sneezing, 
And what I call the cathedral syndrome, if you go in into your flock and they're just sitting there, uh, they may or may not be hunched over, but they won't move. Uh, no sounds coming out of them. This is a really bad sign in any poultry flock for any type of, of, um, of sickness. Um, and it's very, very apparent with, with uh, influenza. However, what you're going to find in 99% of the time is you'll just go out there and your birds are going to be dead. And uh, uh, you won't even, sometimes you can't even see anything wrong with them. They're just dead. So if you run into a situation like that, oh, let me show you a couple of pictures here of um, what they look like. Here's a couple of hens with um, high path avian influenza. Look at how bruised and, and hemorrhagic that comb is and swollen. The waddles are the same. Look at the swelling around the, her, their heads. Um, this gal here is starting to show signs of hemorrhage with a lot of swelling around the head. Here's an onside view of the thickening um, edema and hemorrhage on the comb, the thickening and edema of the waddles, uh, a lot of swelling where the eyes are actually inside there because there's so much swelling. If you see anything like this, uh, there's really only two diseases it can be. It's either high path AI or it's a virulent Newcastle disease. And both of them are, um, uh, are considered foreign animal diseases. And so you need to get a hold of somebody. And the person you get a hold of in this case is the um, state veterinarian's office. And I just want to tell you, this number is the general number for them. Um, however, they'll probably um, have you call Dr. Erickson. I don't have his number right here, but uh, I talked to him another day and he says, just call that number and they'll they'll get a hold of him. Uh, they do have a email address, but in a, an emergency, I don't think anybody's gonna write an email. They're gonna try to get a hold of somebody. Um, this QR code that I've got right there will take you to a, to a survey um, and questionnaire that they will probably ask you about uh, to fill out. And then they will schedule a visit, to, a time to come out and inspect the flock. But what do you do in the meantime? The first thing is don't go anywhere. If you don't have to go anywhere, just stay there till they, they get there. And for heaven's sakes, don't visit anybody else's flocks of birds. And do not remove anything from your premises at that point, any domestic birds or so forth. Uh, just self-impose a quarantine on your place until they can get there and tell you what to do. Now, I've gone through kind of a decision tree here for you um, to help out so that you know what to expect if something like this happens. The officials will come out and visit your flock and they'll take appropriate blood or appropriate samples for a PCR test. That's a type of test to show if the virus is, is there. Um, our Logan lab runs those and it will take um, probably 24 hours before you get results. Um, sometimes it's quicker than that. It just depends on what time of the day uh, they can get them up there to Logan and so forth. On the PCR test, if they come up negative, now, they'll advise you on the next step what to do. They'll probably have you submit some of the diagnostic laboratory, uh, depending on what part of the state you're in, either our Spanish Fork Lab or the Logan Lab, um, for further workup. Because if it's not uh, influenza, it could be some, it's obviously something else. And so we can help you find out what that is. If it is positive, uh, they will call the flock. Uh, that's just a fancy word for depopulation. Any birds on your premises will be depopulated. And right now, the federal government is giving indemnity on those birds. I don't know what the cost or what the price per bird is, but um, they they are at this point. But um, however, there's been discussions uh, now that uh, that pot of money is starting to run out because there's so much of this going on in the country, and I don't know how much longer that's going to go. Uh, they may have to revisit what they do with that uh, that money, but right now um, uh, they have been giving indemnity on on the birds that they have to depopulate. Now, this is just a, a view of showing what they do. Um, on there, they uh, will take a swab and go into the coenal cleft of the of the mouth. That's the the beak right there open. They'll take those swabs, put them in uh, some broth, send them to the lab, and then they do the PCR work on them. And and like I say. Uh, within just a few hours, they can tell you if it's um, positive or negative. So what can you do? Well, there's only one thing that anybody in this world so far has come up with. Um, there are some vaccines, by the way, but they, they're used in other countries. We don't um, allow it in our country right now. And so the only thing you're left with is biosecurity. 
keep the organism out. It's got to come from somewhere. It just doesn't spontaneously generate. And so um, the commercial guys are required to um, submit a biosecurity plan to the state on their places in order to get indemnity on their flocks uh, if they do get if they do break. Um, the smaller flocks uh, owners don't have to do that, but I would still recommend sitting down and see what you can do on setting up a biosecurity program on your place. And it's probably going to be a lot simpler than it would be on these commercial operations. And so the concept is, is you've got a dirty area. That's everything outside the coop where the birds are. You've got a clean area. That's where the birds are. And then you've got some biosecurity barrier, whatever that might be uh, in between. Um, in, in, with some things, a biosecurity barrier, such as a Barbed wire fence can keep things out, but in a case of um, AI, you're going to have to be a little more sophisticated on how you do that. Um, and so you go through a law of probabilities, and there's really a continuum of risk on, on um, if you might, uh, how do you protect yourself? First of all, if you have a nice enclosed building and your, your birds are inside, you don't give them any kind of um, dirty water and you don't uh, let animals track in there. Um, and I'm talking even about dogs and cats too, because they can track things around. And you don't enter that um, other than with washed hands. And if you have to, you put on clean boots. The chances of getting AI are pretty slim. However, if you start commingling types, different types of birds together, uh, you can see a duck right there. A duck is a natural carrier. It doesn't matter if it's a, if it's, um, domesticated or not, it's still got the potential of carrying that. However, these are inside, so that's pretty good. But if you start putting birds outside where they have exposure to um, uh, waterfowl flying over or coming in and eating out of the feeders and that type of thing, uh, that's going to be a greater exposure. And then your worst exposure is, is uh, contaminated um, open source water. And so never use that. Don't let them drink out of ditches. Um, don't use it even to clean things with. Um, that's where you're going to run into problems. Every time, um, there's only two ways of getting AI, and that's either direct uh, contact with uh, contaminated waterfowl, with infected waterfowl, or with contaminated water. That's the only two ways you can get it, other than if you get it and you take it to your neighbors. That's called lateral transmission, and that's a whole different deal. But the initial introduction is only by two sources. So think about this as protectable barriers. And um, and so this is your, your premises just in your yard. And so anything outside, feed stores, um, Walmart, if you show chickens, uh, chicken shows obviously are a dirty area, that type of thing. So think of that as all dirty area. And then kind of an intermediate place um, situation on your, on your yard, you've got your driveway and your home and everything, but then um, you never want to go someplace like a feed store and then go directly out to your your birds. You want to make sure you change clothes. And then the biosecurity um, areas become more and more restrictive. Here, this is the entrance to your chicken place. Uh, you, you might have a, a pan of, uh, of disinfectant that you walk into as you enter into an ante room. And then you can change clo clothes into, or not, at least have, put on coveralls at that point, have some coveralls that are dedicated there, along with um, some dedicated shoes. They can either be tennis shoes or anything. It doesn't matter what it is, just they never leave this place. So you put those on, and then uh, you access your pen areas. And, and then you consider the pens as really the inner sanctum as far as uh, biosecurity goes. You don't want to enter them if you can help it. If you if you have to, make sure your hands are washed and everything. And um, then you gather your eggs, feed and water and, and so forth. And then it's just reversed on the way out. In your ante room, you take your coveralls off, take your tennis shoes off, put on your street shoes, dip them in the, in the disinfectant as you leave, and you're off on your way. Um, if you have sick birds or if you show a bird, you always want them to go into a quarantine area before. And, um, and so never go back into those into your well chickens after you've come out here. So it's a one-way street. If you have to go back, you better change clothes and go back in there because uh, uh, especially with, with influenza, uh, you'll track it in. That's very, very easy to track in. But this, this uh, procedure of, and the concept of protectable barriers will work for anything. I mean, you should. this is, should be something that you put into play to protect your, your birds against anything. Um, we just happen to be talking about influenza at this time. So um, in summary, 
Keep in mind that hands and feet are the major touch points. Um, wash, dis disinfect those. Identify protectable, protectable barriers. An entrance to bird area, entrance to coop, and entrance to the pins. And uh, this is probably the most important. Don't use open source water for anything. That includes ponds, canals, ditches, um, especially for drinking water, but don't even use it to clean equipment with. Limit human and pet access to the bird areas. This includes pet dogs, and um, sometimes they'll follow us in. We don't think about that. Uh, quarantine any new acquisitions for three weeks. You get on the internet, sometimes they'll tell you two weeks, but uh, three weeks is uh, what you want to do. Um, and if waterfowl hunting, shower and change clothes before taking care of the home flock. Don't uh, let your hip boots and um, waders and things like that anywhere close to the, the buildings. And for sure, don't uh, gut and clean waterfowl anywhere close to your, your chickens. And um, then the other big risk factor is intermingling flocks. Um, if you if you at all possible, separate them. People say, well, how far do they have to be separated? And there's really no uh, distance. Um, it's a matter of biosecurity between them. You can have uh, two types of birds separated by two miles and you can still track things into them. And so um, if you have ducks, you're gonna have to treat them as a biosecure uh, entity before you, you know, and your chickens is something else. And so this will increase risk greatly if you do that. Um, in fact, the outbreaks that uh, we've had, um, a lot of them have been um, flocks that have been mixed together. You have turkeys, ducks, guinea fowl, everything right in to each other. And uh, like I say, if they come out to uh, and find the, the virus on your place, everything goes, uh, not just whatever was sick. So I don't know how uplifting this uh, presentation was, but uh, hopefully it will um, inspire you. And um, Next time you go to the grocery store, um, influenza was the cause of um, a lot of the egg price increase. And back in in Thanksgiving time, we were threatened with uh, high turkey prices because of it too. But the turkey industry was able to uh, uh, fill in and do a pretty good job of um, keeping those prices down for us. So um, any questions, I'll get on the Q&A after this presentation and see if I can answer them for you. So thanks.